Today we'll be discussing uh, intermolecular forces uh, in the different states of matter, uh, and hopefully you'll have a better understanding of um, uh, or an insight as to, as to what these are. Uh, the we discussed some so, some gases in we did a gas chapter, so you have some understanding of the gas properties and what uh, how the molecules were arranged. Uh, today we'll focus a little bit more on liquids. Uh, solids are usually uh, the realm of material science, uh, which uh, you know you will take in upper classes, uh, and uh, we won't discuss it too too much here. I'll just uh, mention it briefly when, whenever I, I can. Uh, as far as uh, the properties of these three different states, uh, some of these are quite intuitive, and you probably know them. So the volume, for example, a solid retains its own shape. Meaning if you took um, a block of ice, for example, and you put it in a cup, it will still look like a block of ice. It won't, the cup you put it in won't really affect it. Uh, you know, same thing with any solid, really. A liquid will take the shape of the container it is in, but it will not fill it completely. So, again, intuitive. If you put water in a cup, it will take it up until the level that you put the water in. It won't, it won't occupy the whole cup. A gas, on the other hand, will uh, move all its molecules around until the entire container is uniformly distributed with molecules or atoms or gas. Um, and uh, we say that it fills the entire container uniformly. Uh, so that's kind of intuitive. Uh, as far as compression goes, we talked about that a little bit in gases when we talked about work. Uh, we talked about P times the change in volume. You can actually compress a gas, which is the, uh, the nuance behind pistons. Uh, and behind uh, a lot of engine parts, you can compress gases uh, and they can expand, uh, and you can extract work from uh, the compression extract uh, from the compression and expansion uh, cycle, uh, and uh, we utilize that as as need be. If you try to press on a liquid or a solid, they really won't compress much, uh, so we say that they don't have any compressibility. Uh, as far as flow goes, we talked about that a little bit. Um, gases uh, and liquids flow, like water would flow, but also, um, you know, air flows. Uh, and, you know, so that, that's kind of like um, one of the properties of these two states, where the solid cannot flow uh, at all. Uh, because it is a solid, it's, it's bound by other forces. Uh, as far as diffusion is concerned, diffusion is uh, how... Um, how fast something is distributing itself within a, uh, the state of matter you're in. So, for example, uh, if you took a, a bag of tea and you put that in water, uh, the tea it brews and it does so by diffusing its particles throughout the cup. Uh, if you put salt in water, for example, as well, it will dissolve and it will slowly move uh, until the entire thing is a uniform solution. Uh, until the point where it's a uniform solution, it is said to be diffusing. Okay, it's do doing so fairly slowly. Uh, so if you if you put uh, if you put say salt and water and you don't mix, uh, it will eventually become a uniform solution. It will take a really long time. So that's why we have to mix it. Um, and so we say diffusion within a liquid is slow, but it is still done. Uh, whereas in a ga in a gas, it's much much faster. Uh, things diffuse much much faster when we have gases because they expand they expand much much more rapidly. Uh, within a solid, you're not going to see much diffusion. You do see it, but it's even slower than within a liquid, uh, especially since you can't really mix the solid. Uh, you know, try to put a bag of tea inside of ice. That's really not going to um, brew really well. Uh, as far as conduction goes. Uh, and you will discuss this when you take heat transfer or when you take uh, so something with electrical conduction or take material science or things like that. Um, solids conduct heat and also electricity much, much better than the other two uh, phases. Uh, <coughs> gases, even if they're ionic, won't conduct electricity very well. Uh, a solid will. Uh, so really understanding the chemistry behind that uh, is... Uh, is interesting and informative when you do take these upper classes. Uh, reactivity, uh, well, gases. If you make mix, if you mix two gases because they move so fast and diffuse so fast and do everything so fast, they can react much faster than uh, than say solids. If you take two solids, that even even though uh, according to our formulas that we've done so far this semester should react, 
they probably won't react very fast. So for example, we talked about uh, acids and bases, right? So NaOH, for example, it's a common base, it's a powder. If I were to mix it with another, um, with an acid that's a, that, that is a solid, uh, two solids by themselves, and I mix them, they might react, but it will take them forever to finish reacting. Uh, but as soon as I put them both in water, they will react pretty fast. Uh, so that's, that's something that, you know, quite intuitive, but I'm just outlining it here for you. If you look at the picture here of how molecules and atoms are organized uh, within each state, uh, you may have also seen this in the past, uh, maybe not. A solid uh, is nice and tidy. The molecules are uh, tidily organized and they form these uh, beautiful patterns that when you take material science, you'll, uh, you'll um, explore much, much farther. In a liquid, uh, the liquid still retains some sort of organization, but it's much less uh, neat uh, because the forces between the two blue circles is still appreciable, not as strong as in, in, in the solid. In a gas, uh, as we approximated, the forces between the red circles um, are fairly negligible. Uh, and so they don't really have some any sort of organized structure. Uh, there is some, but compared to the solid and liquid, it's negligible. What really holds these things together, I want you to think of these as physical bonds. They're not really chemical bonds, they're physical bonds, and they're known as intermolecular forces. And they decrease as you go from a solid to a gas, as you can see. Uh, and another term for these are cohesion, uh, they, that's a force that makes them cohesive, and to understand cohesion, if you think about, uh, you know, you and, you and your friends, uh, you, form a, you form a cohesive unit, right? Uh, it's, you know, the word we use in English to mean uh, sort of like bound together. That's what cohesion means, uh, and it's the same in, uh, in chemistry and in physics and engineering. We call these things cohesive forces, cohesion, uh, forces of cohesion and things like that. Uh, and in this chapter, we'll mostly call them intermolecular forces. Okay. Uh, and let's explore the various facets of intermolecular forces. There's a whole bunch of them. Okay. They're much, much weaker than chemical bonds. So the bond between, say, for example, H2O, the H and the O, is much, much stronger than, between the H and the O inside H2O than between a water molecule and another water molecule. Uh, so intermolecular forces, weak. Intramolecular forces, very strong. They're very strong, call them bonds, we have to break them. Intermolecular forces, much, much weaker. We can break them with our bare hands. We don't have to do any chemical reaction to them, uh, to break them. Okay, there are two major classes. I'm going to call intermolecular forces IMF from now on. Uh, I mean, I'll, you'll see this every once in a while, but I'll mostly call them IMF, intermolecular forces. Uh, and there are two major classes are, well, are the two things charged or they're not? So say, for example, water. Two water molecules are not charged, so will fall in the uncharged species. NaCl, NaCl is charged. So when I'm talking about uh, the interaction between NaCl, between two NaCls, uh, it will be uh, IMF involving charged species. Okay. Uh, so let's first talk about the, uh, the charged species, the ions. Okay. So let's say I have two things here, one that's positive and one that's negative. Uh, as, you, uh, as you remember, positive and negative uh, attract, positive and positive uh, uh, repel, and negative and negative also repel. So we will, uh, we will just we'll try to quantify the attractive force between a positive and a negative. Uh, and it, there's, there's, complication, there's complicated equations to, sh to show this. We're not going to really delve into this. All that I want you to know is that the strength of attraction is proportional to the charges on the on the, the two different ions divided by r squared okay when you take physics you will see this equation again we talk about gravitational forces very similar i'm not going to go into this much here just it's a very similar equation okay of all the imfs that we'll be discussing and we'll be discussing another five or so uh, these are the strongest when you have ions. They're very, very strong because they have charges. Uh, and uh, the attractive force between two, a plus and a minus, very, very strong compared to what we'll see later. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> and I'll go over an example using this uh, right now. Let's say I wanted to 
arrange the following uh, molecules in order of increasing intermolecular forces. Okay, and that's, that's a thing you're going to see a whole lot in this uh, chapter, organizing things in order of intermolecular forces. Okay, so we have calcium chloride, sodium chloride, and aluminum chloride. And I want to know which one is the strongest. Okay, so as a reminder, uh, the attraction, the attractive force, is proportional to the charge on ion 1 times the charge on ion 2 divided by the distance between them squared. Okay? Now, I say here in red, well, for me it's red, for you it's orange, uh, that the distance between the ions is constant. So I don't care about this R squared. It's going to be constant for all three. Okay, so it's really, I'm going to look at the numerator. Okay, let's look at this. Calcium chloride, well that's calcium chloride, if you remember from um, naming, that's what this looks like, uh, which means calcium here has a charge of plus two, and chlorine has a charge of negative one. All right. Uh, if I look further uh, at the other two, I have NaCl for sodium chloride, and this is plus one, and this is minus one, and uh, lastly I have aluminum chloride, okay, uh, and chlorine again is minus one, and aluminum is plus three. Okay, since the R is the same, I'm going to neglect it. And I'll say that the attraction here, let's call it ATT for, I don't have to write attraction, it's kind of long. Attraction for each one of them is proportional to the charge on ion 1 times R charge on ion 2. So, fairly simple, 2 times 1. So the answer here will be 2, whatever. <coughs> uh, and there's no units because it's just proportionality. Here it's 1 times 1, uh, and the answer here is 1, and here it is 3 times 1, and the answer here would be 3, okay? Uh, and just note, I'm taking the absolute values, which is 3, 1, 2. I could say that the force between aluminum chloride here is 3 times as much as it is in an ACL. I could say that, if the distance is the same. Okay, so if I'm organizing them from weakest to uh, strongest, it will be like this. NaCl is the weakest, followed by calcium chloride, followed by aluminum chloride. Okay. Uh, and so that's, that's that. So that ho hopefully was fairly simple. <clears throat> Let's move on to uh, the other type of ionic... Uh, attraction or intermolecular force and that's what happens when I have an ion and something that's not uh, an ion okay so let's say for example I have water we talked a little bit about dipoles and you know let me just switch over here just for a second so in water we talked about this uh, in previous uh, chapters and we talked about chapter 8 and 9 in the geometry we saw that water was bent right and because it was bent, it had. Uh, it, we said it was polar, not in. It was not nonpolar because it's, it's it's polar. It's bent. It has two poles. And what we said about the poles is that each pole, sort of like the north and south pole on Earth, has a charge associated with it. And we talked about electronegativity as well. So an electronegative. If you look at the periodic table. Uh, very, very crude periodic table over here. We said that electronegativity increases this way. Okay, increases. Meaning that I will tend, as, as an atom, an atom tends to grab more electrons the farther up and right it lives. Okay, since oxygen lives here and hydrogen lives here, Oxygen is much more electronegative than hydrogen. 
meaning oxygen will pull more of the electrons towards its side. So if I were to draw this thing sort of like this, right, where the H's are here and the O is here, and I were to call, say, um, this negative and this positive, okay, uh, very, very qualitatively, what would happen is because oxygen is more electronegative, it will grab more negative towards it, and it would look like this, that the positive is more here, you know, and the negative is more here. What does it mean? It means I have two poles. <clears throat> it means that uh, essentially this area of the boomerang looks more negative, and this, these two areas are more positive. So, if I have an ion like Na plus or something like that, that's coming uh, and seeing water, what would happen is it will make water reorient itself to the boomerang faces. I really am terrible at drawing, so excuse me. The negative side is going gonna, is gonna to be facing towards Na plus because negative and positive attract. Okay, so hopefully this kind of makes sense. What happens when an ion sees something that's not... Uh, charged, uh, but we call it dipole. Dipole for di for two poles, two poles, it's got two poles. So again, looking back at this, uh, and of course my colors are flipped here, sorry. Here blue is negative and red is positive. Uh, and so you can see that the blue is going to be attracted to the positive side of, uh, to the positive of the, uh, the ion that's positive here. It's going to orient this ion, uh, this dipole, this way, because the ion is positive. Okay, uh, it's just it's just a reorientation, and I'm not going to use this formula. We're not going to do this at all in this class. I'm just showing it to you for your interest. There's a moment. It's called a dipole moment, and it's equal to the charge times the length, the separation between them. So here's a separation between H and Cl. If I can I can measure this distance, uh, and I can do a charge, charge of an, of an electron, for example multiply them and I get a dipole moment. It's very similar when you take physics um, and we take statics to moments and moments of inertia and things like that are very similar in scope. We're not going to do this here, I just, I'm just showing it to you. That there is this thing called dipole moment that quantifies how strong of a dipole it is. Don't worry about it, just worry qualitatively about this picture I just drew before. Okay, this is weaker than ion-ion interaction. Yeah.